If you were freshly released from life in an underground bomb shelter in a post-nuclear wasteland full of murderers, maniacal machines, mutated monsters, and mech suit mayhem, what the hell would you do? Lucy's leaving home to rescue her kidnapped dad, and she'll find that the surface ain't what it used to be. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the wasteland and survive the Fallout series. Once there was a happy cowboy who spread cheer and delight to birthday boys and girls all over the land. Put a pin in that, okay? Because this is a Jonathan Nolan show, so we'll get to what that means, but it's going to be a minute. Right now, just remember the cowboy. His name's Cooper Howard, and he used to be a movie star and TV spokesperson for the vault tech vaults. Now he's bitter and alienated, but on the bright side, that doesn't matter anymore because just then, the entire world is engulfed in a nuclear hellfire. Hey, you got lucky, buddy. The end. Of the world, not, not the show. 219 years later, Lucy's a peppy and productive member of her underground society, living in Vault 33 with her father and brother and about to get married. And I mean productive, literally. After a council confirms that her reproductive organs are intact, she's set to be married off to a rando from the next vault over, number 32, and start a family and solidify ties between the neighboring communities. They get right to that, and everything seems to be going well between her dad, the vault's overseer, and Vault 32's overseer, Moldevere. Unfortunately, <laughs> As they often do, her bratty little brother spoils the party when he wanders over to the other vault and realizes that everyone there is dead, and it's been burned to the ground. It turns out Vault 32 was taken over by a band of raiders from the surface, and they want 33 next. Lucy is able to gently incapacitate her guy, but gets stabbed in the process, which sucks because that dress was probably expensive. Ultimately, the vault dwellers rally and almost oust the raiders, but suffer significant casualties, like a fork in the eye to a pregnant lady who doesn't take it very well. Even the vault itself helps out, cheerfully cutting one of the invaders in half with a door. After drowning his new son-in-law in pickle brine, Overseer Dad finally runs out of moves and Moldevere forces him to choose between the life of his daughter or everyone else in the vault. He picks Lucy, shoving her to safety and quickly getting knocked out and dragged away. It's unclear whether the rest of the vault dwellers live or die, as a huge explosion fills the screen and we transition to Maximus. Specifically, Maximus getting the snot beaten out of him. He's desperate to become a squire, which is basically a glorified gopher for a knight of the Brotherhood of Steel, a guy in power armor who goes around the wasteland looking for pre-war tech and laying down the laser law. For now though, he just cleans toilets, which he doesn't take very well. In fact, when one of his classmates gets wounded by a razor blade in their boot shortly after landing a slot, it looks like the authorities suspect him of the dirty deed, since they drag him off in a black hood. He gets questioned, but maintains his innocence and thanks the Brotherhood for adopting him when he was orphaned, which seems to smooth things over, because he's assigned to his friend's spot, after all, as a squire to Knight Titus. The new team is dispatched right away to search for a key piece of ancient tech the Brotherhood has made their highest priority. Supposedly, it's in the hands of a rove enclave doctor with a bow tie and dog meat companion. Luckily, the folks underground have indeed survived, and they start to clean the place up as Lucy heals from her wound. As a next step, she pitches the idea of sending someone up to the surface to rescue Daddy Overseer, but the council's too scared of the outside world, and you know what? After all, the outside world just stabbed a pregnant lady in the eye with a fork. Still, our gal can't be dissuaded. She gets her pal, the gatekeeper, to help her open the vault door and runs off anyway. It looks like she's got the wild wasteland perk on, because the next thing we know, it's the middle of the night and three dudes are digging up a fresh grave in order to make contact with a ghoul. Turns out it's our old friend, the cowboy, with the pin in him. And they want to cut him in on the bounty for the doc and the dog pair that everyone's looking for. He doesn't take it very well. He takes the job though, and we're off to the races. Naturally, the one character not looking for them, our pal Lucy, gets ambushed by them the first night she camps out. The guy warns her that she can't hack it in the real world, then wanders off into the dark. Maximus finally lives out his dream, being a golf caddy for some douche in armor only the golf bag is even bigger and heavier. When they find evidence of the targets outside a cave, Knight Titus orders Maximus inside only to get wrecked by a Yao guy, post 
busted up just behind him. You see, that's the problem with mech armor. No peripheral vision. Max shoots the bear and saves his charge, but not for long. After Titus insults him some more, Maximus lets him bleed out and takes the suit for himself, vowing to bring back the target and make the Brotherhood proud. All right, that was a lot to get through up top, because the surface is a deadly, deadly wasteland. But at this point, I'd like to pause and drop some knowledge bombs on vault Tech, Lucy, Maximus, and especially that Vault 33 Council. You're telling me that you have two sister vaults literally connected to you, and you only check in on each other once every three years? You should be having student exchange programs, a joint council, interdependent specialization. vault Tech didn't even build an inter-vault intercom system? What was even the point of building these three adjacent to each other? Maybe if you had more frequent contact, you wouldn't immediately believe some random woman you've never seen before claiming that she's the new overseer. And I said it on the Dead Space episode, people need to stop building automatic doors that are strong enough to cut a body in half. That's got to be a building code violation somewhere, right? Of course, Fallout fans know that vault Tech's stupidity is a feature, not a bug. Part of Fallout's thing is satirizing the naive cheer of the 50s, and Lucy definitely embodies that. That said, she's also routinely badass with that syringer of hers. So you might expect her to have some more robust survival skills. She doesn't take nearly enough water, makes an exposed fire, and attracts rad roaches, and does essentially nothing to safeguard herself against the elements. And God, that jumpsuit must reek! I understand that she lives underground, so maybe the woods aren't her natural habitat, but they say that they're tracking how much radiation there is up on the surface. If you have sensors up there, you can't put some cameras up there too? Maybe send out a scout or two to bring back at least a cursory understanding of the few square miles around your safety hole? Feels like that would make the safety hole even safetier. The Fallout games always lets you bring one companion, so it's also surprising that Lucy refuses to let Chet join her on her quest outside the vault. Even if it's your weird cousin who has a crush on you, two is kind of the ideal number of people in a survival situation. Much more capable than any one person alone, but not a group so large that it attracts unwanted attention or drains rations too quickly. Lucy goes it alone, throwing herself into the uncharted, running on pure grit. Incredibly brave or incredibly stupid, you decide. Speaking of incredibly stupid, a quick word of advice to the pickle barrel guy. To escape having your hair grabbed from behind or head being pushed into water, you want to reach back, place your hands over the attackers, then rotate your body from your hips, twisting their arms into a joint lock. You're welcome, but also your lungs are already full of brine, so that probably comes as a little consolation. On the bright side, think about how well your body will be preserved. And while I'm picking on side characters, here's a pro tip for true survivalists. If you can't be bothered to check your boots every time you put them on, at least stop trying to wedge them on as soon as you feel the big flat edge of the top of a razor blade pressing against your foot. I know that sounds crazy, but the boys down at the lab have been testing it out with monkeys and we're up to an 85% survival rate. But enough appetizers, back to our mains. Maximus needed to study more, full stop. For a guy who's so devoted to getting his own suit of power armor that he'll basically second degree murder for it, he seems legitimately surprised at some of the features, like those flamethrower wrists. That's like being the biggest Superman fan, but not knowing he has laser vision. A word? Like Cyclops? No, you illiterate swine. Superman's from the 30s. Cyclops is the imitator. And the dude can't even control his lasers. It's like, get a grip, Scott. My point is, it's the apocalypse. There's no TV, no internet, and no bocce ball. All you do is get raised by a cult to obsess over this armor. Maybe take the time to learn all the controls before you jack one. Now, thankfully, we don't actually live in a post-apocalyptic society like that of Fallout. But sometimes, reading the news sure makes you feel like it. There's a lot of information out there, and sometimes it feels like getting to the bottom of a story is impossible. That's where Ground News comes in. Ground News was created by a former NASA engineer to help people navigate the complex world of news. It gathers articles from over 50,000 sources around the world, so you can see how different outlets are covering the stories that you're interested in. Go to ground.news slash how to beat to check them out. Not only that, but Ground News gives you context about each source. No more of just hearing one faction's side of things. 
you'll see their political bias, how reliable their reporting is, and who owns them. All this information is backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. Let's take a look at a recent story on TikTok starting to label AI-generated content. This story has been covered by over 81 sources on Ground News. 74% of the majority of coverage is from sources within the political center with 19% from left-leaning sources. It's actually a news blind spot for the right, as just a small fraction, 8%, of the reporting is from sources that lean right. If we scroll down, we can also see that 87% of sources are highly factual and that 58% of the coverage is coming from media conglomerates with just 4% of coverage from independent news sources. Having access to different perspectives is crucial. And let me tell you, Ground News empowers you to think critically about the news you consume, and this is a mission I fully support. See discrepancies in how stories are covered or not covered at all. Practice critical thinking and form your own opinions. Find common ground between different viewpoints. Develop empathy and understanding of different perspectives. And more importantly, share good information with others. Want to give Ground News a try? Head over to ground.news forward slash how to beat for 40% off unlimited access this month to see the whole picture and make reading the news less apocalyptic. Thanks again to Ground News for sponsoring this atomic video. Go to ground.news forward slash how to beat to give it a try. And remember, if you sign up through my link, you'll get 40% off of the Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all their great features. And now, back to the wasteland. Back in the present, Lucy comes to her first town called Philly, but when she asks around about how to catch up with Moldavir, the locals don't take it very well. That's when she crosses paths with the doctor again, who it finally turns out is named Wilzig. He's got mysterious business in town, probably a food truck concept or a pop-up all-ages party venue. Before we can find out, the ghoul shows up to claim his bounty, and just claims the foot part of it to start with. This leads to a little misunderstanding, by which I mean a shootout where he punches holes in half the town. He even stabs the doggo, which I mean, like, now you know why he's the bad guy. He'd probably kill Lucy too, except that just then, Knight Max jetpacks in eager to make an impact. The survivalist in spandex introduces herself to the murderer in robot armor, while the zombie cowboy shoots at them. It's a classic meet-cute. The battle ends with a stalemate between Maximus and the ghoul, and Dr. Wilzig getting a new robot foot and teaming up with Lucy, who's going to escort him to Moldavir, which it turns out who he was headed to link up with anyway. So Maximus gets jetpacked way the hell far away, Lucy and the doc are on foot, and the ghoul is on their trail. Well, first he stops real quick to prove that you can pet a dog in this game. A stim pack or two later, Pooch is back on his paws again, and the ghoul has a new buddy. Apparently, Lucy forgot to pack any, though, because Wilzig bleeds out, like, immediately. With his dying breath, he urges her to cut his freaking head off with a chainsaw and take it to Moldavir to, quote, change the future. Of course, every single thing you do changes the future, but I guess he means in some particularly good way. Wilzig also calls Lucy by name, which is weird because she never mentioned it. Even creepier, Lucy is super comfortable carrying around the head without any kind of container, and even shoves a tracking device up its nose for safekeeping. She also finds a little glowing device installed behind his ear, but can't get at it. Then she can't get at it even harder, because the head gets swallowed by a giant mutant salamander called a gulper. Not to mention, the ghoul catches up with her along with the dog, who seems totally retrained already to follow him instead of Wilzer, which is super disloyal if you ask me. Bad boy. Bad CX-404. As this is all going down, Maximus is having problems of his own. He stopped to repair his armor after the ghoul fight, and home base calls him trying to raise Knight Titus, so he pretends pretends to be Titus and reports himself dead, but that just gets them to send another squire to his position. To make matters worse, he gets caught up in yet another wandering combat encounter when some raiders take an interest in his stuff. Max fights his way to the suit, shoves one arm aside, and crushes a guy's head like a watermelon dropped from a hot air balloon. The rest scatter, like you would in this situation. 
He gets fully suited up just in time to intercept the new guy, Thaddeus, his devoted servant, as long as he keeps pretending to be Knight Titus, that is. Using the ghoul's signature radiation trail as a guide, they give chase. Back at the docks, the ghoul uses a tied-up Lucy as bait to attract the gulper, which must be a good idea. I, I mean, he knows what he's doing. Lucy's able to fend it off with a little help from dog meat, but she's still getting dragged around by a rope until they can get the head back. Ditching the dog, the ghoul takes Lucy for a walk. Let's rewind to talk about that shootout. Now, Lucy does follow the basic active shooter protocol of run, hide, fight. Can you tell where Lucy messed up? That's right, the fight part. Now, fight can mean a lot of things, but when a pizza-faced bounty hunter is blasting baseball-sized holes in everyone willy-nilly, it should probably mean that you use some stealth and come out gunning with something larger caliber than a dart. Lucy had plenty of time to grab one of the many, many weapons we see scattered all over the town, and if you're not picking up weapons as you go until you're lugging around an impossible pile, you're not doing Fallout right. And again, if God forbid you're ever in an active shooter situation and it comes down to fight, please don't monologue. Knight Titus of the Brotherhood of Steel, stand down or be cut down. Especially if you already have the drop on them. Get the job done and then dispense your hilarious one-liner. Like, imagine if Lucy snuck up behind the ghoul with a plasma rifle. It seems cooler than getting tied up and drowned, but maybe that's just my opinion. The ghoul's following Lucy and Maximus, and Thaddeus is following the ghoul, and absolutely no one is even thinking of taking the time to cover their tracks. It's not like they have to constantly sweep up after themselves, just cover enough of their tracks to leave a big gap in the trail and throw off your pursuers. And if you have to leave your power armor somewhere to go into town and buy parts, consider hiding it too, or at least locking it. And if you're telling me that power armor doesn't lock, I'm telling you that's a huge design flaw. So huge that we need to go back and redesign the drawing board itself. You know who we haven't checked in on a while? Vault 33. Turns out the good folks Lucy left behind took a bunch of raider prisoners and have decided what to do with them. Lucy's brother Norm suggests killing them all and risking some negative karma, but the rest of the group decide to rehabilitate the prisoners instead and integrate them into society. I'm sure that'll go great. They better get to it quick though, because their water chip was also destroyed in the battle, meaning they only have about a two month supply of the wet stuff left. On the other hand, Maximus has plenty of water because he just got to the docks, but then he's quickly attacked by that same pesky gulper. Luckily, with some quick thinking and clever timing, Max is able to delicately turn the animal completely inside out and empty it like ripping open a wet paper bag. This means our boy from the Brotherhood now has the football, by which I mean that doctor's severed head. The ghoul drags Lucy through a ghost town where they meet then eat an old friend of his named Roger. She eventually gets so thirsty that she drinks some irritated water from a hubcap too, so she's picking up clutch survival skills left and right. The ghoul has a little problem though, which is that he needs to constantly ingest vitals of special anti-zombification drugs. When he gets low on the juice, he starts having a coughing fit, which Lucy takes as an opportunity to make a run for it. Ghoul catches girl, girl bites ghoul's finger off, Ghoul returns the favor. Now that the small talk is out of the way, the bad, bad man takes Lucy to a super duper mart, where he trades her for a Mr. Gutsy hovering robot for a two month supply of his zombie juice. The robot fixes her finger, calmly informs her that he's going to harvest her organs, and puts her out with a trank dart. When she wakes up on a gurney with a saw blade inches from her torso, kicking the saw to the side where it cuts through her restraints. She then defibrillates the crap out of the Dr. Robot, which isn't something you can do in the Fallout games, but totally should be. Lucy fills Gutsy's syringer with a Braxo drain cleaner and uses it as a makeshift gun to force the slavers who run the organ harvesting facility to release her and all of the other folks that they have locked up. Unfortunately, some of those turn out to be feral ghouls, and they don't take it very well. A slaver versus ghoul fight breaks out, and when the dust settles, Lucy's the only survivor. Man. And she's tough to kill for a vault dweller. In a stunning display of mercy, she then gives the ghoul his vials anyway and takes off on her own, presumably flipping the lone wanderer perk back on. The ghoul takes a beat to rest up, even pausing to watch an old tape of himself. 
which means that holotape survived for two centuries, which is the hardest thing to believe in this show so far. Back underground, Brother Norm and Chet, the gatekeeper who was crushing on Lucy, do some digging around through the abandoned Vault 32 and discover that the bodies there are years old, meaning the raiders couldn't have been the ones to massacre them and terminal records indicate the vault door was opened from the outside by Norm and Lucy's mom, Rose, who's been presumed dead or missing. Again, saying hey to your vault neighbors more than once every three years would have mitigated a lot of these problems. You see, communication is key, people, but the issue of refusing to step foot outside Vault 33 goes further than that. Consider the fact that the vault was able to be invaded specifically because they trusted fake messages from Vault 32 at face value, without questioning the raiders' claims. Now they've paid the price yet they're still only communicating with Vault 31 through messages and accepting them without question. There hasn't been a meeting of the elders. No one's even checked the other vaults or resources to scavenge. Maybe Vault 32's water chip still works. They wouldn't know, though, because the only two people exploring it and trying to put together a timeline are having to sneak around to do so. The show actually does do a good job of depicting what's so dangerous about a totally insular society. As safe as it might feel, feel to crawl into a hole with all of their stuff, the fact is that everything on Earth is connected, and they'd be better off exploring those connections than hiding from them. Make alliances and treaties, not just walls and closed doors. Otherwise, you never know what's festering out there in the dark, but it's probably rad roaches. Oh, that reminds me, you know the constant problem Lucy faces of never knowing where to go to get clean water? That's actually something we've already solved with a little device called a reverse osmosis pump. They don't require electricity. They remove 99% of radioactive contaminants, and you can grab one online for about 100 bucks. Why vault Tech didn't issue one to every dweller, I'll never understand. Even without a pump, we know that she can make a campfire, so boil that sh Last but not least, always shoot your captor in the head if given the opportunity. I kind of can't believe I have to say this, but it's just not the right time for a big showy act of mercy. I like you. I want you to live. Next time you've got the advantage, just take the shot. Lucy's not alone in her incompetence, though. Case in point, the very next thing that happens is Maximus decides to tell his squire Thaddeus his real identity, rather than killing him to tie up the loose end. Big mistake, it's Fallout. Always choose kill. Thad's able to disable Max's mech and leaves him locked up in his T60 without a fusion core. That's where he is when Lucy happens by. She helps him out of his armor. He gives her some rat away so that she doesn't die of radiation poisoning. It's a classic second date. They decide to team up and track down the all-important head, which is currently in Thaddeus' hands. Lucy is willing to give the head to the Brotherhood instead of Moldavir, if they're willing to assign some knights to help rescue her dad. Everybody wins, except the guy who got his head cut off, I guess. They tune Lucy's Pip-Boy to the tracking device in the nose and head out. This is the Wasteland, so it's not long before they run into some cannibals. Maximus downs them both with Lucy's gun while taking a shot in the arm. She becomes one notch less naive when she sees a billboard for the New California Republic and realizes that vault Tech's story about a great reclamation day when the dwellers would return to the surface and repopulate the Earth was just a marketing gimmick. Then, while scavenging for a first aid kit or a stim pack to treat Max, both of them get gassed and drop down chutes into yet another vault, which it turns out are more common in the wasteland than heads on Brahmin. Down in Vault 4, Max's gunshot wound is quickly treated, and he and Lucy are quarantined in a room that, unbeknownst to them, has a big sign on the outside that says Test Subjects. Traveling is bringing the couple together, too. Lucy's DTF from Jump Street, but Maximus keeps things light with just a handhold. Their tender moment is a little ruined, however, when they realize most of the people in Vault 4 are mutants with one eye or two noses or mitten hands. Meanwhile, Norm and Chet, aka the Fallout Hardy Boys, wrap up their investigation of Vault 32, but decide to keep their discoveries to themselves for the time being. There's a vote for new Vault Overseer, and Betty, one of the council members, takes it in a landslide. Norm is suspicious of her motives, especially when she announces she's splitting the Vault's population so that they can reclaim 32, where all the bodies have been mysteriously removed. 
He asks her where his mom's pit boy ended up after she died, and she lies and says it was buried with her. Man, if you can't trust the surface dwellers or the vault dwellers, who can you trust? The dog was the answer, but you squandered it. Okay, leaving the dog behind for now, which is exactly what you shouldn't do, let's get back to those bloodthirsty cannibals on the bridge. Lucy thought the best way to ensure safe passage for both parties was for everyone to keep their hands up as they crossed. Now, if you put your hands up at home right now and just imagine a gun on your belt, you might notice you can still reach it within, say, like a half a second. Your hand can go up in the air to right back down to your holster. That's just facts. Maybe next time they should have the other group walk entirely away and like sit down a hundred yards off. Then they cross, then the creeps cross. There are ways to work this out. If the cannibals refuse to be orderly about it, just get out of their way and come back later or find another crossing. In a world this dangerous, taking chances in close quarters with desperate strangers is never going to be the safest strategy. And how about that power armor, huh? So you can't lock it to protect it from getting stolen or ransacked by raiders, but someone else can easily lock it from the outside and make the night inside slowly die of thirst, a triumph of sci-fi engineering. If that's how much the Brotherhood of Steel thinks things through, my caps are on the Enclave. And a tip for Maximus, he should have stripped that thing before he abandoned it. I get that the armor can't be moved anymore, but we just saw Lucy use a Mr. Gusty tentacle like a gun. You're telling me there's nothing useful attached to that robot suit that he can dislodge or pry off of there? Even the outer shell of armor itself could be strapped on. We already know it snaps on and off because Knight Titus made Maximus clean his crotch piece. And that's rated M for mature. I'm also getting the strong impression that our heroes should just avoid vaults entirely. The surface world might be full of murderous lunatics, but at least you can get far away from them. This is an end of the world scenario. That means desperate people and desperate people are dangerous. If they had a vault all to themselves, sure, great. But putting a bunch of survivors in a box underground with limited resources is just asking for trouble. They'd be much better off in a cabin in the mountains or camping somewhere remotely. At least then all they'd have to worry about are death claws and cazadors, which they can mostly avoid aggroing if they toggle crouch. Of course, a life of solitude isn't always an option. If you're like Norm and you get born into a vault but then uncover a vast conspiracy, definitely tell someone. In fact, Norm should tell everyone. He should blow the whistle immediately and hard. Keeping the damning information to himself just means Betty and the other overseers have less mess to clean up after they take him out. Back to the story. At the super duper mart, the ghoul wakes up from a night of doing hard chems to find two guys who claim to represent the government looming over him. They march him through the desert at gunpoint while he reminisces about his wife and daughter, life before the war. While most of his friends were telling him that Vault Tech was evil, he kept doing ads for them because his wife worked there and wanted to get their family into a special manager's only vault. In the present, he arrives at a building with a sign on it that just says the government and meets up with Sorrel, the self-proclaimed president of the region. He's upset that the ghoul shot up an organ farm under his protection, but before he can feed him to the pigs, the ghoul takes out both of his guards and demands to know where Moldaver is. Cut back to the past yet again, and we see Cooper going to a meeting of the Communist Party, where he meets her for the first time, which should be impossible considering it was over 200 years ago. Damn, did the nuclear holocaust actually kill anyone? Everyone in the flashbacks seems to still be alive. Anyhow, we find out that he actually worked with Moldaver to try and uncover some of vault Tech's crimes before the bombs fell. In 2277, the ghoul continues to track her relentlessly, eventually killing a kid who knows her location, which turns out to be Griffith Observatory. At the same time, Lucy and Max chill for a while in Vault 4 and the Vaulties even lug his power armor back for him. That said, everyone's a little too cheerful here, and if you ask about level 12, they all clam up and act weird. Still, Maximus enjoys caviar and a hot shower, and Lucy joins all of the people in the vault who originally came from the surface to take part in a ceremony. This turns out to be even weirder, as the dwellers all get naked, drink blood, and smear the ashes of the dead on themselves before unveiling a huge flag of Moldaver, who they call the Flame Mother. This chick is everywhere in this episode. Lucy immediately goes to level 12, since that's obviously where the hideous secret is hiding, and as you might expect, it's a straight-up horror show. 
There are a bunch of crazy experiments in progress, people in stasis everywhere, and when a scientist realizes she's in there, he reaches for an emergency harpoon gun. The room quickly floods with blue suits, and Lucy is taken captive again for like the sixth time. Maximus is none the wiser, still posted up in his new room, wearing a robe and slippers and chomping popcorn like a boss. The Fours tell Lucy that their ancestors were actually the victims of horrible genetic experiments, and the people people in stasis are being tended to for that reason. This explains the wide array of mutants in the vault and also reveals that every vault tech vault was originally designed as some kind of social experiment, 33 included. That's all well and good until they drag her away to be punished for trespassing and pass right by Max's window. He kicks into gear, stealing the vault's main fusion core and uses it to power his suit back up for a rescue mission. Tragically, he's so busy handing everyone their asses that Lucy doesn't have time to explain that her punishment was just a slap on the wrist and a trip back to the surface. And the Vault 4 folks are actually super nice. Feeling bad, they return to the stolen core and leave the T-60 behind. This leads to a heartfelt conversation in which Maximus tells Lucy about his real name and letting Knight Titus die. And Lucy invites Maximus to come live in Vault 33 once they find the head and get her dad back. Again, everyone wins. Except the Vault 4 guy Lucy threw acid on in the fight. Out in the wasteland, Thaddeus the Squire has the very valuable head all to himself, plus a crushed foot from the fight with Maximus, and a dog that won't stop following its master's head. He locks the dog in a Nuka Cola bin, which is a real asshole move, and limps across the desert hoping to get all the glory. Lucky for him, at least for now, he also runs into a wandering doctor with a serum that literally makes his foot unbreak itself like a damn Harry Potter spell. In fact, Let's address that foot real quick. First of all, never trust someone calling themselves a doctor, but working out of a ruined building in the desert. Even if you live in the Fallout universe and that describes almost all doctors, great, then don't immediately trust any doctor. Matter of fact, that's probably good advice in our universe. Just because someone has a white coat on doesn't make them infallible. And this guy's wearing a gold chain and a fedora. Thad shouldn't just drink anything he hands him. In a desperate wasteland full of murder and mayhem, this guy has a drink that literally morphs your destroyed foot back together like Play-Doh. He's not mass producing it. In fact, apparently Thaddeus has never even heard of such a thing. So it's basically a magic potion as far as he's concerned. Situations like that are what the phrase too good to be true was invented for. If you don't believe me, keep watching until the end. Do that anyway, whether you believe me or not. It's YouTube, baby. Hopping back a bit, as you might if you only had one foot, I'm surprised the ghoul doesn't have more survival sense. So far in the series, we've seen him consistently one step ahead and in tune with the wasteland, yet he gets blackout wasted without setting up traps or even alarms. Forget that. When we met him, he was buried in a hole in the ground. If he's going to do the most drugs ever assembled in one spot, he should have dug a quick grave and passed out in that. No chance of wandering encounters, and you get to sleep it off with a lovely dirt nap. Honestly, I'm also confused as to why the ghoul lets himself be led at gunpoint by only two dudes, considering we've seen him take dozens of bullets in the back without slowing down and shoot up the population of an entire town. We'll let that slide, since it's not really a survival issue. On to Lucy. Don't go to level 12. Do not go to level 12. She has no reason to. She's trying to find her dad, and this has nothing to do with that. If she feels she's justified in being suspicious of the mutant society, she should grab some supplies and get out of there. She was never there to stay anyway. She has a quest to continue. Even if Maximus chooses to stay behind, remember she was doing just fine by herself for a long time before he showed up. Part of me just finds it hard to believe Lucy would have gotten so caught up in a side quest like that. But regardless, I do have one tip for you. If you must sneak into a hidden lab designated off limits by some nice people who just happen to look a little different than you, bring a partner and a weapon. Hell, bring a partner, a weapon, and a couple of stealth boys. At the very least, scope the place out for a day or two and see if you can find any patterns. Are there fewer people inside at any times of day or night? Any unsecured points of entry? Is there a way to get some information indirectly? Don't just get a hunch and go straight to that place. Stop down for a second and make a plan. Of course, not all plans form from good intentions. 
Down in Vault 33, Betty sorts everyone into two groups so that they can repopulate 32 whether they like it or not. Also, all the raider prisoners get poisoned and die. Basically, no one's having a good time but Betty. Norm wants to know why, so he sneaks into her office and uses her messaging system to make contact with the overseer of Vault 31. Pretending to be Betty, he talks his way into an in-person meeting. Back on the surface, the ghoul follows Thaddeus, picking up his on-again, off-again dog companion on the way. Lucy and Maximus catch up to him first, though, at a wasteland radio station run by Fred Armisen. Because, yeah, he'd totally survive in the apocalypse. After a booby trap accidentally goes off and spears Thaddeus in the neck, that wound heals itself just like his foot did, and he realizes that the miracle serum actually turned him into a ghoul. That means the Brotherhood will shoot him on sight, which is unfortunate for him because that's right when they show up in Vertibirds. Thad makes a run for it and gives up the head. Max and Lucy kiss, then she takes the real head to go find Dad while he turns himself into the Brotherhood and tries to give them a fake head he just kind of found on the ground. It's kind of weird that the Brotherhood of Steel guys don't immediately check the head for the little piece of tech that they want because they don't. Instead, they fly Max back to Philly, where they've cleared all the locals out and set up camp. When the lead guy does inevitably find out that the head is empty, he's about to have Maximus executed. But then his old friend, Razorblade Boot, pleads for his life and admits to planning the injury themselves to get out of duty. Max avoids a bullet to the head, but he isn't out of the irritated woods just yet. The old scribe guy still wants him to lead them to the relic, and now he also wants to use it to start a new Brotherhood of Steel splinter group, with Maximus as one of its lead knights. While he ponders that little job offer, Lucy finally arrives at Moldover's observatory hideout, head in hand. She's taken up for a meeting where she sees her dad in a cage and not in a good way. Moldover takes the artifact out of the head, then proceeds to tell Lucy the big, dark secret about her father and vaults 31 through 33. Simultaneously, Norm discovers it for himself, just like Cooper did in the past when he spied on a meeting of Vault Tech and other executives. Basically, the CEO of every major company was in on the Vault program. In the case of Norm and Lucy's vault, they filled 31 with middle managers frozen in stasis, then thawed them out one at a time and made them overseers. Just to seal the deal, the most powerful business people in America pulled strings and got the bombs dropped themselves, intentionally, to make sure that the vault program was a success. They literally engineered the end of the world for corporate profit. Lucy realizes with horror that her dad is an original Vault Tech executive from two centuries ago who's been gaslighting her for her entire life. But wait, there's more. When Lucy's mom fled to the surface with the kids and made her home in Shady Sands, a big survivor community, he had the whole town nuked and mom turned into a hideous feral ghoul. Not cool, dad. Not cool. Now Moldover wants him because only a Vault Tech employee can activate the device that we've been chasing this entire time, which turns out to be a cold fusion generator capable of supplying infinite free energy to the whole wasteland. Lucy convinces Dad to give up the code. Moldover triggers the device, and we're off to the races. The Brotherhood show up in force and clash with Moldover's troops, Maximus included. Then the ghoul shows up too and starts taking knights in full power armor to school with his pistols and grenades. Max makes his way to Moldover's office and frees Lucy's dad, just in time to learn that he's the one who blew up Shady Sands and killed everyone he ever loved. He doesn't take it very well. Dad hops into some empty power armor and knocks his ass down, so Lucy pulls a gun on him. Before she can make up her mind to pull the trigger, the ghoul pops in and does it for her. He just wings the guy though, and Dad flies off to fight another day. You know, I just realized both Lucy and Norm try to solve their problems by skulking around in the forbidden area, whether it's Vault 32 or Level 12. I guess that's not too surprising, seeing as how they're siblings written by the same writers. But what is shocking is that no one follows up on the poisoned prisoners. I thought he and Chet were detectives. What happened to that? Or let's at least see Betty looking shifty-eyed as she tucks an open box of rat poison into the bottom drawer of her desk. As far as actual survival goes, they probably should have worked up a secure process by which prisoner meals are handled. 
food should go directly from the cooks to the server and travel only through secured areas. Then, if there is a poisoning, they know where to start. Again, security cameras would be a good investment. Thaddeus, try not to chill in the middle of dozens of unsprung booby traps, my man. That's Survival 101. Maybe more importantly, don't take off sprinting when you're in a relatively open area and the people you're afraid of are in the middle of arriving by helicopter. At that point, all he is is visibly fleeing and cops and soldiers tend to react one way to that. Thad is either getting minigunned in the back or if he's lucky, rounded up and questioned until it's too late to hide his ghoulishness and he gets shot by some other kind of gun instead. Currently, he has magic healing powers and looks 100% human. In light of that, he should probably try and talk his way out of this one. There's no reason to believe he can't hold his shit together long enough to finish the transaction and stroll away calmly instead of dead. And while I'll give our heroes Lucy and Maximus points for the old head switcheroo plan, I still think that there was a stronger option available. After all, the only reason they don't gun them down right there and then is because they don't check the head, which is again, dumb luck in their favor. Considering that Lucy seems to get away successfully, maybe it is a good time for both of them to flee now that the helicopters have landed and are in the middle of unloading. With fleeing, like with comedy, timing is everything. Maximus was just planning to live with Lucy in Vault 33 and is obviously in love with her by this point. Often, the safest way to survive a confrontation is to avoid it entirely. Then of course, there's giving up, which is the route Max chooses. Not as popular, but at least he's got a smashed head with nothing in it to offer. Not a terrible plan for improvising in the heat of the moment. You know what I mean? Like, he was spinning a lot of plates. So the ghoul plans to track Dad down and hopefully get some answers from vault Tech, and he invites Lucy along for the ride. Despite their differences, she leaves Max unconscious and takes off towards a brand new quest marker. Maximus wakes up just in time to see Moldover trigger the cold fusion device and light up the whole city before dying of her wounds. He's thoroughly disillusioned with the Brotherhood of Steel at this point, but he's kind of trapped because they all did flood the room and declare him champion for taking Moldover out, which he totally didn't. In our final scene, Lucy's dad runs all the way from LA to Las Vegas with nothing but the power armor on his back which is patently impossible, but also cool as hell because it means that season two is going to be the new Vegas season. I hope they have the Yes Man robot in it. I could really use some of that positive energy in my life. Regardless, even though Cold Fusion is a thing now, it's a safe bet that the struggle isn't over yet for Maximus, Lucy, or the Ghoul. Each one still has to deal with the fallout of their decisions. But what the hell would you do? I personally love Fallout, as you can see, New Vegas, Best game in the series, we know that. I can't wait for season two. You know, they kind of teased the Vegas thing going on there. And I, you know, generally just enjoyed the show overall. It was f great, better than any video game adaptation that I've, I think I've ever seen. So kudos to Microsoft and Bethesda and Amazon and, and Jonathan Nolan and all those motherfuckers. But let us know down in the comments what you would do. Thanks for watching, leave a like and subscribe and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. Have a damn good day.